Hello everyone, my name is Pixel Riffs and welcome back to the Minecraft Survival Guide. I hope you're all having a good day. Today we're going to start something big and special, something that's going to keep us going in this world for a long time in terms of certain resources. We're heading out to the ocean monument that we have raided in a previous episode, where we are going to begin the project of turning it into a farm for Prismarine. If I remember correctly, over here in the nether, one of the first nether portals we ever made actually leads out to the ocean where our monument was and from here we should be able to spot what will become our guardian farm give or take the zombie piglins that are in the way and yeah there we go the monument is over here we've raided this in the past so we should no longer have to contend with any elder guardians or anything inside of here meaning that we can set this whole thing up to be a farm without worrying too much about mining fatigue. Although we do still have to worry about the other guardians, apparently. <laughs> and I didn't exactly come prepared with any water breathing potions, but that's not the point of this segment of the video. The point is to demonstrate that the guardians that spawn around here only spawn in a very specific area. In fact, they are limited in their spawning to anywhere above the base of the monument. You'll find them swimming around in open water around the outside, but in terms of where they actually generate, this layer of prismarine at the bottom of the ocean monument, the one that the supporting pillars of prismarine brick are holding up, that is effectively the threshold for where the guardians will begin to spawn. You'll notice that there aren't even that many underneath this area. Most of them have just swum down from where the entrance is. You don't find them spawning in this area, you only find them drifting down here by chance. And so anywhere from the base of the monument on upwards is the spawning ground for guardians. We're going to create an area in here in which the guardians will spawn, be driven into a chamber where we can kill them easily or they can die of their own accord, and they will drop prismarine shards and prismarine crystals, which we can use to create every single prismarine block in the current palette. In the case of dark prismarine, we'll still need to get hold of some squid ink to craft this in large quantities, but that's another farm for another time. And of course, there are several schools of thought when it comes to designing a guardian farm out of an ocean monument. There are several ways of doing it, some of which are more complex and time consuming than others. And the farm we're gonna be committing to is fairly time consuming to create, but we'll leave this as both a really effective way to get hold of prismarine and a pretty awesome landmark for our world. Basically, my philosophy with guardian farms is if you're going to make them you want to make them look impressive and so we're going to head back over there with a couple of basic materials just to explain a couple of concepts we'll be working with here and then we're going to undertake a pretty large project of draining a section of ocean. I'm also going to dip back into here and grab the conduits that we last used when we were draining the area that contained our trail ruins. Now over here in the center of this monument is a 2x2 area, which we're going to build up from like so to create a platform where we can hopefully hide from all of these guardians before they kill me. <laughs> this is where something like an invisibility potion might come in really helpful, but honestly if you build this platform up enough and create an area where you can kind of cut off line of sight with the rest of the guardians, then they won't bother you for a little bit at least. At all times when we're making this farm, we need to remember that the key to avoiding being attacked by guardians is to put a block between you and them, breaking the line of sight for their laser attack and forcing them to start it again. So once we're standing in a 2x2 area like this with walls all around us, most of the time you should simply be able to crouch and that will cut off the guardian's line of sight to you. It is rare that one of them will be able to aim a laser at you above these walls. Now the bottom layer, the base layer of the ocean monument structure is 58 by 58 blocks and that is the case regardless of the ocean monument that you've raided. They're all the same base size, it's only the rooms inside that change shape a little bit. So we're going to grab, since we've got a 2x2 two two in here already, we're going to grab 27 blocks and we're going to bridge out to the edges of the square where the ocean monument has its boundary. And since we've got swift sneak, we can do this pretty quickly, so hopefully we shouldn't get lasered by too many guardians in the process. And this should give you roughly the dimensions of the area in which guardians will spawn, give or take. In my case, I'm actually going to extend these arms outwards a little bit further and begin a circle that's going to stretch all the way around the outside of this, making sure that the corners of the monument are included inside the perimeter of the circle. And we're going to create these perimeter walls all the way around the outside, which will block any water from coming in 
Canyon and then drain the center of it so what's left is the Ocean Monument itself. From there we're going to take advantage of Soul Sand mechanics and Soul Sand is kind of the inverse of a magma block. If you've ever run into magma blocks while you've been exploring the ocean and noticed them dragging you downwards, Soul Sand is the opposite, creating a column of bubbles that propels entities upwards. This is going to require us to deconstruct a lot of the monument here. We need to demolish large sections of it if we're going to use the base of the monument as the area for our Soul Sand and it makes sense to do that because that will provide us with the largest water area in which guardians can spawn and so they'll spawn at a pretty decent rate. Although there are some things that can help us do that before we even drain the monument. And If we break on through to the central room of the monument here, take care of any guardians that have managed to spawn inside and set up our conduit, we can set up an area in which we'll be able to have that conduit power effect to help us breathe underwater and mine blocks quickly. Using the natural blocks of the ocean monument, we're actually able to set up the rings of the conduit without worrying too much about bringing too many additional blocks with us and there we go that should be the full conduit power in effect but in this case I think I'm simply going to leave it here as an aid to visibility and water breathing while we work on the remainder of this project we're going to dig our way out of the monument we're going to return to the surface and we're going to plot out an area that we're going to drain one way you can make it easier on yourself plotting out larger structures like this, especially if you're trying to draw a circle around a square, is by using graphics tools. In this case, I'm using Photoshop. I'm just going to drag out a square here, and the square needs to be 58 by 58 pixels, since that is the shape of the base of our ocean monument. We'll pop that in the center there, and then we can simply switch to a circle drawing tool to draw a circle around the outside. We'll center that on the canvas as well. We'll simply drag it until the corners of the square square disappear. We can take a look at those two overlapped like that and the corners of the square are just touching the corners of the circle here. And by taking a look at the dimensions, what we've got here is a circle with a width and height of 84 pixels. So it's got an 84 pixel diameter. We can take that information and plug it into the plots ellipse generator. Plots.co.uk is a fantastic tool for modeling a variety of different shapes in Minecraft. And in this case, we have simple sliders that we can drag out to that 84 by 84 width width and depth. And that is the circle that we are going to be drawing around our ocean monument in the survival guide world. The number up here in the top right will tell you how many blocks you need to create this circle and you can switch between 2D and 3D modes where the 2D mode will actually give you a counting guide for how many blocks you need to place around each side of the circle. And of course since this is an 84 by 84 circle we need to expand those stone arms that we've already built over the top of our ocean monument to be 42 blocks long. That way they'll reach out all the way to the area where we're going to be building the circle around the outside and that will make it a lot easier to measure. This time around though I'm going to minimize my harassment by guardians by brewing up a few invisibility potions. Invisibility potions are created by brewing a night vision potion using a golden carrot and then inverting it using a fermented spider eye. From there we can use redstone dust to increase the duration of these potions so they give us eight minutes of invisibility and that should give us plenty of time to work. Invisibility potions are actually at their best if you remove your armor. Mobs will be able to detect you a little easier if you're still wearing something that's visible. And the invisibility potion isn't perfect because mobs within a certain range will still be able to detect you. However, since guardians prefer to attack from range, they'll typically swim away, at which point they'll lose interest in attacking the player because the player is invisible at that range. And that means we can take down our central safety barrier and continue extending these arms out to a distance of 42 blocks. And then building out from the very edges of these arms, we can start counting the perimeter of our circle. When you're counting these out, I do recommend using a different block as a temporary block if you need to place blocks on a diagonal like this just so you don't end up placing stone here and counting that as part of the circle when it shouldn't be. And thankfully with eight minutes of invisibility I've been able to extend those arms and get one quarter of the circle drawn. We can confirm that those two points have matched up correctly which is great. Always the nerve-wracking thing about building these circles but I'm going to chug another invisibility potion and we'll get the other three quadrants all drawn out. In fact this circle is large enough that I haven't even needed to drink another invisibility potion to build at the second quarter because the guardians are also distracted by other stuff in the area that I can probably just chuck my armor back on and not worry about the invisibility potions at all. And just like that, our circle around the outside of this ocean monument is complete. And it's always really cool seeing big structural things like this built in Minecraft. So seeing a giant circle laid out over the ocean <laughs> always feels exciting to me. I'm going to go around the circumference here and take out the prismarine bricks that I was using as temporary blocks just so they don't confuse me a bit later. And what we're left with is this ring of stone that represents the area we're going to completely drain of water. The next step is likely 
likely to require a couple of invisibility potions as well, because in order to effectively drain this area, we need to cut it off from the rest of the ocean, which means, yes, placing blocks underneath this ring of stone all the way down to the ocean floor. And naturally, to complicate this project even further, I want to do this in style. So our next port of call is going to be a desert where we need to pick up a truckload of sand. And so I return from the desert with my shovel absolutely destroyed. <laughs> I basically worn this down until the durability bar was no longer visible, although that could still mine about 300 blocks by my estimation. And we have four shulker boxes of sand. Well, three and a half, really. But we're going to put one of these through our automatic furnace. But since our furnace is relatively low on fuel, there is coal coming in behind the charcoal, but I don't believe there's a great deal of that in there. We're going to revert to using buckets of lava, which we are now farming over in the mud factory. Remember that each bucket of lava will smelt 100 blocks. So this is 200 blocks worth of smelting for each furnace right here. And with eight furnaces, that's 1600 blocks or about the capacity of a full shulker box. So I'm going to set all of this stuff smelting and go and repair my shovel by trading with the local villagers. And hopefully by the time all of this sand is done, we should have plenty of glass that we can work with. Actually, turns out I miscounted. We had a fourth full shulker box of sand in the ender chest that I just put in the second row of shulker boxes so I didn't recognize it. So we still have a bunch of sand left over and that is going to be vital to the process of draining the monument. And a short while later, all of these furnaces should shortly be switching off, give or take the amount of fuel I've had to burn in order to smelt these last few blocks of sand. But we now have a full shulker box of material right here. And there we go. That's the last of the furnaces. So there's a little bit of glass still coming into this barrel from where we exceeded the amount of glass that we were going to fit in a single shulker box. But this shulker box, we're going to take down to the storage system and we're going to turn all of this into blue glass. We have a decent handful of blue dye in here, but of course we can turn lapis into blue dye very easily. And we've got so much of that from mining, that I figure we can just make a couple of stacks of that and see how we get on. In fact, I'm not gonna turn all of this into blue glass yet because I'm not certain how much we will need to fill in the bottom half of this cylinder, but we will see how we get on when we return to the Guardian farm. And the other shulker boxes of sand, I am going to leave here in the central area because we're going to need those in the near future to help us drain out out all of the water. But for the moment, we're going to head out to the perimeter of this ring and we're going to start placing blue glass. Hopefully the conduit power that's inside of there should give us plenty of the water breathing effect around here. And I brought the invisibility potions back because I have a feeling these guardians are going to be keeping a watchful eye on me as I go around here placing all of this blue glass. But we'll do this from the outside so we can minimize the possibility of that happening. And the one thing we just have to make sure of is that we've got a silk touch pickaxe on us and that we don't end up misplacing too much of this glass with all of the kelp around. Even though it's a transparent block, glass will still block guardian lasers. So it's always worth dodging behind these blocks in case one of them starts to target us. But for the most part, this should be a relatively chill task to complete. And with all of that blue glass that I just crafted placed here, we have only covered about one quarter quarter of the circle. So <laughs> it's a good thing I got so much sand, isn't it? I think we're going to need to smelt one more full box and probably one of the boxes that had maybe half of its contents in there. We've still got some glass left in this one that needs dying blue, but as you can see, it's barely visible under the surface of the water. Once we remove the water from this area, though, the effect will be pretty striking because it'll look like the ocean wall simply stops there and is surrounded by this barely visible perimeter of dark blue glass. In the meantime, we're actually gathering a few drops around the center here because guardians tend to be drawn towards light blocks, not in such a way that it makes it a super reliable method of farming them. But right here, you'll notice that the dolphin is playing with a bunch of guardian drops which have appeared around the center here as a result of the guardians swimming in towards the sea lanterns in the middle and then getting killed by the conduit. So that's a fun way of picking up a light amount of guardian drops while we're working on the rest of this project. But for now, back at the base, we're going to load even more lava into the auto smelter and collect some more lava from our mud factory building. Then we'll start the auto furnaces going again, smelt up a bunch more sand and replace this barrel here with a shulker box that will collect all of the glass for us when it's ready. We'll break down some of our lapis blocks into regular lapis and from there into blue dye so we should have enough to dye the entire circle and I'll bring you folks back in when we've got the rest of that glass placed and we can talk about the next steps for preparing this farm. 
Okay, at last we are back here and we have all of the glass in place. This was a lot of glass. I basically used up every piece of glass that I have except for these few stacks here. Two and a bit stacks is what I have left and the entire thing from the surface to the ocean floor is now completely surrounded in glass. Which is good because it means we can move on to the next phase of this project which is to drain the interior section of the monument and this is not something we will complete in today's episode but I'm going to spend a bit of time on streams doing this this week and hopefully we should be able to get to the next phase in which we design the actual situation where the guardians are going to be spawned and then killed in this week's episodes. But I may need to go and brew a few more invisibility potions because a lot of guardians are spawning around here and our next stage is going to involve coming out into the center of the monument here a little bit because we're going to have to place a lot of sand in a grid that's going to help us break this down into manageable areas of water to absorb using sponges. We're going to grab a bunch of sand from our shulker box here and we're going to go straight across this part of the circle where it's relatively thin, leaving maybe a three or four block area at the widest part where water is still present. And yes, this means we're going to get hit by guardians occasionally, but we can always fire on them with a bow if we need to, as long as they are close to the surface of the water. Shouldn't be too difficult of a problem. But we'll start over here, and one thing you need to bear in mind is whether or not there is any kelp below the surface of the water, which might break the sand when the sand falls. But if the sand is able to land on a solid block, it should be able to simply stack up like this until it reaches the surface of the water and from here we'll continue to bridge on outwards dropping the sand in from the top as we go so we don't have to spend the entire time submerged in water we can hopefully avoid getting lasered by too many guardians and slowly but surely we can divide this area into a grid of boxes with a column of water that can easily be absorbed using some sponges but placing this amount of sand manually takes a staggeringly long time so there are a couple of bits and pieces that we can do to improve that. In this case, we're going to place a block of sand here and we're going to allow pistons to assist us with pushing the remaining sand in our inventory out along this line, probably removing this block here so that it doesn't get stuck on that. We're going to put a couple of blocks either side of this block here at water level so that we can place some redstone components on those. We need to make sure we have a redstone dust here and a solid block attached to the side of the piston so the redstone power will power the piston whenever we power this block in front and then we're going to place a repeater facing in towards the area we'll be placing the sand and make sure that's powered from one side and as you'll see that ends up pushing the sand blocks off whenever we place one in front of the piston. So now by holding down right click I can simply have the piston move the sand for me and that allows me to stay outside of the range of any guardians who would wander on through here. It might even be possible to place another piston on here and have that happen even faster thanks to a reaction where <laughs> this piston gets an update from the piston above it. That allows this piston to react faster to the point where it's actually moving sand on what we can consider a zero tick basis. And as you can imagine that's going to immensely speed up the process of placing all of the sand. The only limitation being once the piston reaches its push limit. Once we get to 12 blocks in front of this piston the 13th block will just cause it to jam basically. Once again we need to be aware of any situations in which sand would be falling on top of a kelp block and that's potentially going to prevent it from creating a column here but on on this side of the monument at least we seem to be free of kelp. But once this contraption has placed all the sand it can we simply need to move it down to the end of the section we've just finished placing and that will allow us to complete a wall of sand using this piston assisted method which will be much faster than placing it manually. If you don't get a zero ticking reaction from a piston placed on that block another thing you might want to explore is to have a dropper or a dispenser on that block to dispense sand back at you similar to how we did in the concrete maker where it was giving us concrete powder every time the redstone mechanism went off. That would simply allow the stack of sand in your hand to refill automatically, so you won't need to go back into your inventory to grab more sand. So thanks to these little redstone contraptions, there are lots of different ways that we can make this simpler. Now that we cut off one of the edges of this circle, we're going to continue to make these walls of sand, making them in a sort of grid, so they can go horizontally this way and horizontally across that way as well. And we're aiming for boxes of water no bigger than about 3x3 or 4x4, depending on how much sand you want to place this way. I think we'll 
probably aim for a 4x4 grid. So our next sand placing piston pusher can go here. It looks like this one isn't getting that zero ticking reaction, so I can take that piston away and maybe we'll replace it with the dispenser like I mentioned before. We'll throw a few stacks of sand in here. I'll keep one in my hand and I think I should probably go and brew some more invisibility potions if I don't want this kind of guardian attention. But standing here will allow me to refill the stack of sand that's in my hand like so and we can continue a line of sand all the way across the top of the ocean monument. But this is going to take a lot more placing and a lot more sand by the looks of things because I've only got a couple of shulker boxes left with any sand in them after having turned a bunch of it into glass. So we're going to go away, get some more sand. I'll place a bunch more of this on a live stream. And when we come back, we should hopefully have a decent grid of water boxes arranged over the top of this ocean monument. Hey folks, welcome back. So I have now put about nine or 10 shulker boxes of sand into cutting up this monument into bite-sized chunks. And as you can see, we are just over a third of the way done with the sand grid. But this is the point at which Having used this much sand, I am fairly determined to drain what I have, recover all of the sand, and hopefully create the rest of the grid using the sand that's already covering this half. And for that, I brought a bunch of sponges just so we can recap how to use sponges in a situation like this. Basically, all we're going to do is dive down below the surface by one or two blocks and place a sponge, and that should dry out the majority of the water in that area. Of course, it's going to dry it out slightly weirdly because the sponge isn't always going to recover exactly the same amount of water around it. So on occasion, we might have to place a couple of sponges here and there just to make sure that they dry out the water in a slightly better pattern. But at the bottom here, all of the kelp's gonna pop off because it no longer has any water to grow in and we can simply, what the heck is happening with this cod? <laughs> this cod is attached to the sponge above it. Well, not anymore, unfortunately. Well, this is the point at which I'm gonna bring out the hoe once again because this is the most effective tool for dealing with sponges. You should just be able to instantly mine those off the wall. And you'll probably find that these outer sections are the easiest to dry out, not just because they aren't a full square so you don't have to deal with as many water blocks, but also from the fact that you won't get guardians outside here since they aren't really in the area of the monument itself. Obviously, once you get further in, each of these individual squares might have a guardian or two spawning in it that you will need to take care of. But aside from that, it should be a fairly straightforward process drying out all of these boxes because once you've confirmed that all of the water is cleared out from each of these areas, all you really need to do is come on down here, break the final block of sand and add a torch underneath. And then all of the sand will fall and break on the torch, returning all the sand to your inventory and leaving you with a nice dry open space. And that's how we're going to have enough sand to do the other half of this once we're done drying out this half. And this is where we're going to leave the episode because I just have a lot of work to do here. We're going to clear the entire thing out. Now that you know the theory, you know it is possible yourself, but it's going to take a fair amount of time in order to do all of this. So I'm going to come back in the next episode and we're going to discuss what we do with the monument once it is all clear and drained. But you might notice in the meantime, that my armor is looking a little different, and that's an unfortunate tale that comes from the live stream on which I did a lot of this sand placing work. Unfortunately, at one point during the stream, I put my shulker box down here on the side of the tank, just to get some invisibility potions or something, just to make sure I was out of guardian line of sight while I refreshed my gear. And I had put my armor in there, my full set of netherite armor. I still had my elytra on me, but the rest of it, because I was using invisibility potions, was better left somewhere else, and I didn't want to have it gumming up my inventory when I needed to place so many stacks of sand. Unfortunately, at one point, I placed a shulker box against the edge of the tank like this, and I broke it in order to collect it, but something about the water physics carried it away in an unpredictable direction. And at the time, I just didn't notice that shulker box floating away in a weird direction, thought I had collected it from my inventory, and I had block sounds and stuff turned down because of all of the piston noise. And unfortunately, the box that had all of my armor in it floated away and must have despawned. I only noticed it by the time my invisibility potion was about to run out, and that meant eight minutes had passed, meaning that five minute despawn timer was up. So on the stream, we commiserated, and I decided to use some of the backup equipment that I have from all of these ancient city and end city raids to make myself a new set of netherite armor. So the enchantments on this are gonna look a little bit different, and I don't have any armor trim on it anymore. So I'm gonna have to work on getting the armor trims back, which means I need to go diamond mining 
to replace some of those smithing templates. But I managed to get a swift sneak book, obviously got plenty of those from the ancient city, so that's back on my leggings. I don't have feather falling on my boots, but the rest of these boots are looking pretty good. I had two pairs with the four different enchantments that you see here that I could just combine. And the helmet, I turned into netherite and enchanted it straight away from that. And I got myself fire protection this time instead of regular protection, but I think we had blast protection on the boots, so it all sort of evens out. Anyway, that's another lesson I have learned from this, is not to leave shulker boxes floating in the water when you're working on a project like this, and hopefully that warning prevents some of you folks from losing any of your equipment as well. But that is going to be it from me for this episode. I hope you're looking forward to the next episode in which we're going to do some more with this ocean monument. But for now, thank you so much for watching this episode of the Minecraft Survival Guide. My name has been Pixorifs. Don't forget to leave a like on this video if you enjoyed it. Subscribe if you want to see more, and I'll see you folks soon. Take care. Bye for now.